<clears throat> All right. Well, today we're going to talk about Justin Martyr. And what's great about Justin Martyr is, first of all, he's one of our first uh, apologists in Christian history. Um, one of the, the many uh, first of our church fathers that we can talk about. Um, obviously, Polycarp would be before him, but he's you know in the in the top few uh, running there. And what's nice about Justin Martyr is, well, he was searching for the truth. He went through about every possible philosophy you can think of, um, and that helps us get a little familiar with ancient philosophies. Now, you might think, are we learning any these ancient philosophies simply because this is a uh, this is a philosophy and Christian thought class, and so we have to just get familiar with that. Um, as you know, sometimes in classes you have to get to know things that have no real meaning in life. And what's what's interesting is that ancient philosophy is a huge part of American thought today, huge, because ancient philosophy is constantly trying to find logical ways to make us autonomous thinkers to separate us from the spiritual realm in a way that we are outside of the world looking in so that we can make informed decisions. And this is the ancient philosophical viewpoint. It's why those that were before Socrates, what we call the pre-Socratics, were always looking for what the essence of the universe was. Because if you can find the essence of the universe, you can get your hands around it. Does that make sense? If I know that thing that the whole universe is made out of, I can see it from a distance. And I can, I can get my, my head around it, I can get my hands around it, and I can then categorize it. And now I, the independent thinker, has categorized the universe. And oftentimes, uh, that has slipped into Christian thought. And Justin Martyr although he had dabbled in many philosophies and rejected them, a lot of that way of thinking stuck uh, in, his, in his thoughts. Okay, so the purposes for today's class. We want to follow Justin's uh, philosophical journey. I know that sounds very <laughs> stupid, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, he did. He had kind of a journey. I wish there was a better word for it. Uh, he had a journey that he kind of, you know, was looking for truth and just uh, found philosophy lacking. Um, but why he found philosophy lacking is where we're going to have a little differences with him. Uh, we're going to review the ancient philosophers who influenced him. We're going to demonstrate Christianity's early uh, infestation of philosophy. Um, and then there's one more thing we're going to do um, that I added, which i praying we will have time for. Uh, and that is, I want to demonstrate how it is that we are to think when someone who is from the philosophical world wants to engage us. Um, this is very apologetic-like, but... One thing that Justin has helped us out with, uh, he was he kind of felt the early an, an early way of of uh, the way Van Til thinks of of engaging what we call an interlocutor or a someone that is engaging us philosophically. How do we how do we engage them back? Um, how do we give a reason for our beliefs that Scripture tells us we need to have? Um, there is a there is a method, and it's an easy method. It can be taught within, I would say, ten minutes. You could learn the biblical method of of engaging people that are challenging your faith. Um, being an apologist uh, is is not difficult in knowing the method. Being an apologist is difficult in that you have to know pretty much all of church history because all of apologetics stems from church history. You have to know systematics because everything you believe and engage with that other person comes from Scripture. And you need to know philosophy like the back of your hand because that's the enemy that's engaging you. 
So you really have to, if you get a PhD in apologetics one day, you're really getting a PhD in three different things if you want to be good at it. I mean, not everyone's good at it, so. <laughs> um, I don't think I'm good at it, so. Uh, but I'm getting through, you know. Okay. Justin's context. This is going to be hugely important for us to understand. Early apologists had a context much different than ours when they apologize for their faith. Now, uh, if you're unfamiliar with that with that term, um, ap apologia is a is a Greek term meaning to give a reason for. In fact, I should stop doing this stuff off the top of my head. In uh, I believe it's First Peter. Uh, when it t says giving a reason for the hope that is in you, the Greek word there is our word apologetics, where we get our word apologetics, uh, giving a reason for. Um, this is why Socrates, the first, uh, the first dialogue that uh, Plato wrote about Socrates when he's standing uh, before these uh, this magistrate, you know, where he has to. He has to say why he believes what he believes. Uh, Plato entitled that uh, the Apology. Uh, Socrates was not apologizing the way we think of it. He wasn't saying sorry for what he believed. He was giving a reason for what he believed. Why he was corrupting the youth. That was one of the, one of the charges against him. He was corrupting the youth. I mean, what's interesting about Socrates, because we're going to be talking about him quite a bit today, is that he was much like an, like an evangelical philosopher. He would stand in the marketplace, and as people would walk by, he, he would say, have you considered why you, know, you think this way? Have you considered your life? Have you thought about why you are the way you are and think the way you think? And he would, like an evangelist, really, like a street preacher, he would stand in the marketplace. This is why he got in trouble. Uh, he wasn't doing it privately. He wasn't having, you know, he, no one was arranging private lessons with him. In fact, he thought it was horrible that anyone would ask for money uh, because knowledge should be free. It should be natural. To ask for money to give knowledge, he, he would just be, a, that's abhorrent to him. Um, so so as, as we look at this, we're going to see Justin... Justin had a belief about Plato and Socrates that is going to seem strange to us, but there are, I, I would say, there's logical reasons why he believed what he believed, but I think he's definitely wrong. So we'll look at that in just a little bit about, about his uh, beliefs about Socrates. Um, in his context, charges are being brought against the church. Uh, by people trying to stir up trouble for the church. This is the early church, of course. In our context, we have people saying there is no God, or that you can't know that you know that there is really a God. And we're coming up against you know blatant atheists. But in those days, no one questioned whether there was a God, and everyone believed there was gods or God. But they just questioned the Christian God. The Christian God was a weird God. It was weird because um, they believed that they were atheists. This was one of the charges that was brought against the early church. So these people are atheists. They're not even really worshiping a God at all. They're saying there is no God. Well, how can they say that? Well, the Greek religious system is a visual one. Remember Paul came into Athens and s looking at all those idols? They, they were so worried they missed someone that they had a, an idol to the unknown God. And that's where uh, Paul was able to you know, start getting them into the conversation. So if there was no, if there was no idols and no physical way to express your worship to that idol. Because remember, the, they, had, they had temple prostitutes so that you could express your, your worship physically. Um, even how you sacrificed uh, different things to them. There was a, it was, everything was very physical and visual for them. And so then you have these Christians who are worshiping a God who they say is invisible and is just spirit. 
And so they said, well, who, what are you worshiping? You're worshiping nothing. Because to them, worshiping an idol was sin. To make an idol, I mean, back then they took the second commandment very seriously, right? To make something that was supposed to represent God was uh, in no way supposed to, supposed to occur. So they were accused of atheism. Um, they understood God to be, as Jesus said, spirit. Remember uh, Jesus sitting with the uh, woman at the well in John. So 24, and she's and and they're having the conversation. He says, and he he expresses that God is spirit, and those that worship Him worship Him in spirit and in truth. Well, here the ancient church is, is holding to this. And to a, to a society that, see, that must see and touch their gods, this was just pure atheism. In Colossians uh, 1.15, you have uh, Christ who was the image of the invisible God. Totheo, all right? Of um, uh, let me see, Totheo to uh, <laughs> Arato. There it is. I thought I had that. I thought I had that better in my head. I didn't. Um, but that's the idea of in invisibility. The ah negating the word visible, not visible God, right? So if, they, if it's not visible, there is no God at all. The early church was being uh, accused of incest. They were told to greet one another with a holy kiss. This even included your uh, relatives. They were calling each other brother and sister, even married people. And they were doing this because in Christ you are brothers and sisters, of course. Now... The question comes down to, were these people really confused by this and really taken back and thinking, hmm, this is, this is really... Ins I mean, it, it's questionable. Um, most, most likely, I'm more cynical towards humans, so I think that probably they understood what was going on but was trying to bring charges that could, uh, that could hurt the church, of course, because these things were illegal. Um... They they were brought a, the charge against them that there was a hatred for the world. This means, of course, insubordination. Right? These people are being taught to hate the world. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Well, the Caesar or the emperor, whoever it is that's in charge... Some of them are supposed to be worshipped. And now you're saying that you're not supposed to love them? And not to mention the fact that in Christianity you can't serve anyone but God. And you can't worship anyone but God. So that's insubordination right there. Remember that citizenship was honorable. And rejection of the culture is a rejection of all that is good. You think of the Manson family. Maybe you guys are too young. Does anyone not know who the Manson family was? <laughs> Sorry, everyone knows. <laughs> okay, uh, they were a hor horrible group of people that uh, murdered a lot of people. Um, Manson is still in jail, I believe, to this day. Um, it's said that he never actually committed any of the murders. He just coaxed others to do it for him. And the kind of brutal murders they did was awful. And so when we think of that as horrible, right? How could you, how could you associate the Manson family, who was committing horrible murders, to, uh, to people that are just doing something against the culture? Well, you have to understand the culture is much different than ours. To us... I mean, especially in America, we look at, I mean, and I don't want to open up a can of worms, but even with the way we look at immigration is a testimony to how 
little we think of um, citizenship in America. Um, we think little of citizenship, so little that if we have a bunch of um, illegal immigration coming in, we think, well, then the best thing to do is just to uh, give everyone citizenship. Hooray! I mean, there's this kind of a sense in which it doesn't mean anything, it just means that you can get a job. But back then, that's not what citizenship meant. Citizenship wasn't just designed so you could have better insurance. Citizenship meant you were a part of society. You were a part of what was respectable. Um, this, this didn't stay in the early church. This went all the way to the Reformation when you look at the Anabaptists. Why were the Anabaptists looked upon as such horrible people? Because they weren't baptizing their babies. Why is that such a big deal? Because now their babies weren't in, ingrained in the church. And being in the church was what it meant to be a good citizen. Someone that is, that is participating in the community. If you detach yourself from the community, what, what laws and regulations do you have anymore? You would be like a Manson family that could go out and do anything. Because there's nothing holding you to the laws of respectability and honorability. And so this was, you know, to, to step back from society is to step out into a world of chaos and lawlessness to them. So you can see that this is this becomes a very big problem when you when you have a religion that says this government isn't my isn't my source of being God is my source of being that is above this government and if my god tells me to do something that's against this government then I do it because I'm not following the government like it's my like it's where I get my being, I follow the Lord. This is, to this society, this is just chaos. So, on some level, there's a, there's a sense in which you are, um, the Christians are really coming across as this chaotic group of people that want nothing but, but uh, chaos in society now. Because once one group can step away, what's everyone else going to do if they don't like the laws or the Caesar or the emperor or whoever? So failure to support the religion of the land is failure to support the Caesar. They were accused of cannibalism. And this, is, this one's a little more obvious. You're eating the body and blood of Christ at communion. This was before the very strong debates. I mean, there was talk, but the, the big debates weren't even here yet over things like transubstantiation, consubstantiation, and s symbolic meanings and things like that. Um, the church was very young. Christ said, this is my blood and body. This is his blood and body. And you take communion, people... Whether you'll have to ask uh, Dr. Barrett, you know the, the fine uh, the fine lines of you know what people were thinking they were doing at that point. Did they think they were doing a symbolic remembrance, or did they think they were actually eating the blood and and body of Christ? That'd be a good question for him. I'm sure he knows a whole lot more than that than I'll ever know. Um, but whatever they were thinking, whether they thought it was symbolic or not. You know, Scripture itself is saying, and this was Luther's big point, Scripture says, you know, Jesus said with his own mouth, this is my body. Luther never walks away from that. I mean, so you have people all the way in the, Re you know, with these people, I mean, looking way down the road to the Reformation, there's still people saying, this is what Scripture says, this is my body. You, you know, how do you get away from from that how do you turn that into this is my body which is a symbol i mean it's a it's a it's a great argument and um uh, of course when you start learning about reformation things like that and uh, luther um there's of course good answers for that i think calvin had the best answer but 
but I mean, you know, we uh, we as conservative Christians always like to brag about how literal we take the bi the Bible. Uh, we take it very literally. We read the Bible literally. Uh, in fact, that was one of the things that you know, in the when I left the dispensational world and came into the Reformed world, my parents thought, "You don't even read the Bible literally, then. If you're going to be Reformed, you don't even read it literally. You're just going to spiritualize everything." Um, and so you know, the bit this, and so then it becomes a big battle of who's taking it more literally. But when you look at you know, Scripture, you have to be very wise, because if you want to say. My, my, the only rule I go by is just taking it absolutely literal. Literally. Then you're, you know, then when you take communion, you're going to be a Catholic. I mean, if you're going to say, well, I don't take that part literally. Or when Jesus said, this generation will not pass. Well, that's not, you know, he didn't mean this one. <laughs> uh, so you understand what I'm saying? That, you know, we can play the literal game, but we come into a lot of problems uh, with, with exegesis when we do that. Okay. So, one of the things, we don't have a lot of writings from Justin, but um, we have a few. Uh, one of them is called his Dialogue with Trifo, and that's where we learn all the different uh, philosophies that he started to, to deal with um, in his journey. If you ever go to Westminster, you will find a man there named Dr. Truman. And there are several things that he despises. And one is that he hates it when Americans use the word journey. He just, he's, he's the guy, he's from England. And so, you know, he already thinks that, uh, you know, you know, we, we as Americans, we're, we're a little more laid back when it comes to things like academia. And <laughs> so when he, when he comes here, he's, he wants to really challenge us. And so when he hears us saying things like, you know, it was just a long, you know, my, my road to the Lord was just a long journey. He gets very upset. And I don't blame him. That's, it's really stupid to say those things. Okay, so, but I have to say, because I don't know what else to say. His road, his road was, uh, was long and treacherous in his philosophical world. So um, his first stop was Stoicism. Um, Stoicism started with uh, Zeno, and what he would do is he would stand um, on his porch, which was called a stoa, and, uh, and he would philosophize. So what Stoicism it came from, you know, the, the name of his porch, you know, the, that's what it was, a stoa is a porch, and so really what Stoicism is, it's porch philosophy. That's the literal understanding of Stoicism. Um, porch philosophy. It's the belief that pleasure must be tempered to reduce the pain of the absence of pleasure. See, Stoicism, you have to understand, a lot of people say, well, Stoicism is when you try to avoid pleasure at all costs. <coughs> and that's not what Stoicism is. <laughs> Stoicism is not trying to avoid pleasure at all costs because they hate pleasure. Stoicism really is trying to avoid pain at all costs. To the point where you don't overindulge in pleasure because of the pain that comes when it's over. Does that make sense? So Stoicism is the constant work it takes to keep yourself from pain. Because to them, pain is evil. Do you understand what I'm saying? To them, pain is evil, so you avoid it at all costs, even if it means I don't get too close to my wife and kids. I get appropriately close, but if my wife or child died, then that would bring a lot of pain. So I'll get close enough so I can deal with the management of my home and the things I need to do. But if I get too close, I might feel pain because they might reject me or they might, I might stop loving them and then I'll have to leave them. 
or whatever it is so you don't get too close so if something happens then there's the pain is not so great because you really didn't know him that well anyway does that make sense um, this is why they didn't overindulge in sexual contact and things like this this is all has this all has to do not with trying to be moral but because pain is the enemy now does this sound familiar to you what was that okay yeah yeah Buddhism very good does it sound a little bit like the way things are in the medical realm here in America uh, one of the classes I teach at the college um, that I'm a professor at is medical ethics and in medical ethics today these books that our textbooks for medical ethics have little to do with what is right and wrong and much to do with managing pain for the patient your ethics no longer stems from what is right or wrong it now is a manifestation of your belief of how it is we manage the pain of the patient if managing the pain of the patient um, is best by allowing them to OD on morphine then that's something we need to start looking at euthanasia needs to be more of a of a prominent uh, place in the textbooks now because if that's the best pain manager for people then we need to go with that um, pot is legalized today in many states because it began with pan pain management and then once you allowed it for pain management then who's to say what pain is maybe I had a bad day today and I have had I have pain I may not have a f something physical in me with pain but mental pain is just as bad it is based on that mental pain that you can get an abortion at um, at trimesters beyond what is usually legal but if you feel you have mental pain over this over this pregnancy it can it can be allowed so our our society and its fascination with pain management especially with Obamacare coming out um, is going to become a bigger deal to the Americans and how we and our ethics in medicine so there I say all that just to demonstrate to you that this that although these are ancient philosophies um, they're still a very strong part of of our of our belief system even today the major contributions of of the Stoics was that a huge emphasis on the value of true knowledge to a Stoic there are there are levels of knowledge um, there's a kind of knowledge you have that you might believe but you accidentally have the right answer um, it's not that you thought about it it's just that you kind of believe this and then it happens to be right Stoics saw that knowledge as, as terrible knowledge to know that something is true was very important to them to have true knowledge not just not just assume knowledge you have to understand um, some of the pre-Socratics those that came before Socrates um, were dealing in a kind of philosophy where they have given up on truth completely said we can't know what's true or false about the world but we can persuade and so that became their their uh, modus operandi their mode of, of of work was how is it that we can persuade the world to do what we want so we can get pleasure but we certainly can't know what's true they were and they called themselves um, the sophists and of course we have the word wisdom in there now this pattern of thinking is still practiced today the thinking that the idea of what is true or false is no longer important we just have to make a case for one thing or another this was the that was the foundation of 
of sophistry. Guess who studies that kind of logic today? Can you guess? What major or what what uh, schooling do you think uses that to prepare people for a certain job today that is definitely not interested in what's true or false, but has to win an argument? Politics, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, they're supposed to pretend like they do anyway. <laughs> what was that? Who said that? You are correct. Yes. Um, if you were to go to law school today, you would still study uh, sophists' uh, argumentations. Because, as a lawyer, you can't muddy the waters with what's true or false. You have to present a case for your client. It's a difficult thing to be a Christian lawyer, I'll tell you. Because if you're always looking for the truth, you're going to I mean you're going to have a hard time making it. Um you can kind of just not worry about the truth and just ask him his side and then ask him never to tell you what really happened. I mean <laughs> But I mean, you know, we we give lawyers a hard time, but it's kind of it's it's kind of earned because you know, if you're truly interested in the truth and you have your client up there on the stand and you're asking questions and one of the questions leads you to believe, wait a minute, that's not right. Do you then say, hey, but you said this last week, this. Now you're saying this. You seem inconsistent. What's going on? I want to know the truth. Your Honor, I think my client uh, actually is guilty. We're, we're going to have to change our plea or uh, I'd be one hungry lawyer, but honest. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean there's a there's a difficulty there but this is where stoicism you know in the light of people who have given up on truth here comes stoicism that says no truth is hugely important and it can be known 